So, Kat, where you go. Thank you. So, hi, I'm Kat, and I'm the Tufts Scholar for the 2014-2015 scholarship. Please do feel free to ask questions on the way through if you've got something you want to ask me, but otherwise we'll chat afterwards. So today I'm going to tell you a bit about my story. Um, it's about having big goals, being determined, doing lots of hard work, um, and not letting obstacles stand in your way. So first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career and what's got me to this point. So in 2008, I graduated as an OT uh, from Exeter University, and it was at this point in my career that I decided I wanted to complete my master's degree. But I didn't want to do it yet. I wanted to have some clinical experience behind me um, and have a little bit more of a focus to it. So I got my first, ro my first post as rotational band five um, in early 2009. And at this point, I was undecided between inpatient mental health and community learning disabilities. So I had my vocation um, covering both of those areas and it also included older adult mental health. So nearly two years later, right at the end of 2010, I got my static post in acute inpatient mental health. This time I was still a band five. Um, I was just settling into um, a static area. And at a very similar time, just uh, a couple of weeks later, I put in my first application for the scholarship. Um, at this point in my career, I was only just meeting the entry requirements for the scholarship, but I thought I'd put in an application anyway. And at this point, I was unsuccessful. So 12 months later, a whole 12 months more experience and some time to work on the application, I submitted a second application and was invited here for my interview. I was unsuccessful in this interview, um, but I was given some great feedback by Jenny about things that I could work on and was asked to apply again in the future. So going away with all that information, I did a little bit more work. In 2013, I got my promotion to a Band 6 OT, so I'm a senior OT on an inpatient mental health ward. And during this time, I was also um, studying at Coventry University and did a master's module just to prove that I could study at that level and restart my education and get back into the, the frame of mind of studying. And then, in early 2014, I put in a third application for the scholarship. Um, and again, I was invited to interview, and this time I was successful. So, third time lucky. A lot of people said to me, third time lucky. I said it myself. Um, and it's something that we commonly use as a phrase. And one of my friends reminded me of this when I was planning for this presentation, and this kind of intrigued me to look into it. Is it really luck, or do you make your own luck? So I did a bit of digging around, and there's lots and lots of different origins, or potential origins, of this phrase. But a lot of them lead back to a folk belief. A folk belief that, despite having lots of setbacks, we should keep persevering and keep trying. And this also links into another phrase that we often hear, which is try, try, and try again. And this one comes from um, a belief that two tries isn't enough, and four is too many. Um, this certainly worked for me. And also, America has their own saying, a third time's a charm. And all of these are not necessarily expressions of luck, but they're about expressions of persistence and determination. And it's all about never giving up. So bearing that in mind, today I'm going to take you through my journey from the application through the whole process of preparing to go to America, to studying there, living there, and, <laughs> um, and all my other experiences, returning to the UK and what this means for me now. So we'll start off with the application. So, as you're aware, I've been through this a couple of times, so I'm quite familiar with this process. Um, the, the scholarship is advertised as a job advert within OT News, and it always appears around November time every year. Um, I quickly learned to look out for this. Uh, and you then request an application form. The application is quite similar to other job applications. You will 
have put in your personal details, you're putting about your educational background, about your work background. But in addition to this, you also have four other questions to answer. One about your CPD activities, another about your personal qualities, a question about your special interests, and then finally a question about how you would use this to contribute to the OT profession. In addition to the application form, you also submit a, um, a reference from your current employer so that there's already quite a breadth of information there ready for the trustees to review. If you're successful with your application, you're invited here to interview, um, and this process consists of a presentation and questions. So your presentation is an expansion of those four questions that you um, answered in your application form, and this is a great opportunity for you to sell yourself to demonstrate how much CPD activities you're doing, how it contributes to your development and others. Um, your personal qualities, what makes you the best person for the scholarship. Um, you present about your area of special interest and what you would like to research while you're abroad. And finally, how you're going to put this to use to make a difference to yourself and the profession of OT. So, after the questions, you'll then, ask them, um, you'll then ask them interview questions by the uh, interview panel. But this is a slightly unusual day because you don't only come for the interview, you also come here for a lunch where you meet the other applicants. Um, you also uh, learn more about the scholarship and sometimes you also get to meet the um, American student who is over here studying as well. So. If you're successful in the interview, you get a wonderful telephone call from Jenny, uh, offering you the, the um, offering you the opportunity. And for me, um, I received this telephone call while I was stood in the middle of Birmingham New Street Station. So it was probably a bit of an experience to the people around me as well as myself. So then you make the preparations to move. Initially, this is lots of application forms. Um, you need to register with Tufts University, you need to submit details of your previous transcripts, send over lots of health information, and do lots of occupational health checks. So a lot of it is just online forms to start with and then posting a few things. This then leads on to your visa application. So again, online forms, um, and then needing to go down to London for an interview for you visa. So this is, you've got several months to do this, you've got February to July to get all this paperwork in. There's set deadlines on the way through, but it is manageable within the time. Aside from this, I was also employed full time, so I had to think about what I wanted to do in regards to my employment. And I was very, very fortunate in that my manager and my employer uh, granted me a career break which meant that I could take 12 months off from work and then return to a job at the end of it. So this is what I did. Um, and then also tying up things at work, I had to hand over my case loads, make sure they were covered. I had to hand over projects um, and just make sure everything was a smooth transition for everybody. And then there's the personal preparations. So I had to move house. I had to pack up all my belongings and put them into storage decide which ones I wanted to take with me for a year. And then it was visiting family and friends. I probably wouldn't see most of them for 11 months, so I did lots of visits before I left. So February to July seems like a long time, but this time absolutely flies by. And before you know it, you're finalising all these preparations. So I was very fortunate during this time. There's a lot of support networks around. So there's the support of the trustees here, there's the support of the OT department at Tufts University and the International Centre at Tufts University. I had the support of my employer and my family and friends to help me throughout that time as well. So when you've finished your preparations, it's time to make the move. So I left my house in Birmingham and moved to this house in Medford in Greater Boston. So during this time, I had lots of emotions going on. I was really excited. I was going back to uni, I was moving to America, lots of new experiences lying ahead for me. But additionally, I was also very nervous. I was moving to America. I had never been to America before. I was going back to university. I had been out of studying for several years. 
um, a full time studying for several years. And I didn't know what to expect the other side. And then I was uncertain. I was uncertain about the expectations of me. So I had my own expectations, but what were the expectations of the university? And could I fulfill the expectations of the trustees? So with all these mixed emotions, I did make the move successfully. Um, and I arrived in Medford at this house, which is where the Tuft Scholar lives for the year. So this is a house for graduate students. There's 10 of us that live there, and it was a mixture of international students and American students. So I was living with people from Brazil, from China, and then from all over America. So including Texas, Mississippi, New York. So it was a real diverse house, and it was a re really great time. We um, had a great diversity of uh, courses. So I was the only OT in the house. There were people doing science-based courses, maths, um, and various other ones. And we had an age range of 21 to 30. So there were lots of social opportunities. Um, not all of us at once, but we, there was often things going on. So within an hour of arriving at the house and being a little bit uh, unsure of what to do next, one of my new housemates was knocking on my door, introducing herself, and we were off exploring the local area pretty quickly. And that is just an indication of what was to come. So Tufts University is a campus-based university. Um, it's the white building on the side here is the Boston School of Occupational Therapy, or it was the Boston School of Occupational Therapy, and that's where I studied. They've now moved to new facilities, um, which are very nice and have got great resources. So Tufts has a lot to offer. It's got lots of social activities, sports facilities, um, there's like your typical things like dining rooms and libraries and study spaces. But there's also things like the Graduate Student Council and the OT um, students who organise lots of social events and lots of things that you can get involved in. And this elephant on the side here is Jumbo. This is the Tufts University mascot. So as a Tufts graduate, I am now a Jumbo. So I went to America with AIMS. So my AIMS were to compare mental health practice between the USA and the UK. This is something that I did at Interfides during my interview, and this was my area of special interest. Initially, I wanted to compare assessments between inpatient units in the UK and USA. However, this later develops as I find out more about the healthcare system. I wanted to develop my research skills. Um, this is both to enable me to better critique research and incorporate EBP into my practice, but also for me to participate in research and be more confident with those skills. I wanted to continue my education in mental health. Mental health is my area of interest and I wanted to make sure that my future education was focused around that to enable me to answer some things that have been challenging in my career and enable me to better support the development of OT and the development of the services that I work in. And on a personal note, I wanted to experience and explore American culture. I was going to be living there for a year. I wanted to immerse myself in it, experience the lifestyle, enjoy the pastimes. And finally, to travel. This is a longer term, ongoing goal of mine. But whilst in America, I wanted to travel around and experience some of the different cultures and areas within the country itself. So we'll start off with my studying. So, in, in America, OT is an entry-level master's programme. This means that all students complete a two-year full-time master's degree to become an OT. As I've already completed my undergraduate in OT, this means I can be a post-professional student and complete a one-year full-time master's. The year that I was there, I was fortunate to be there with four other post-professional students. There were three girls from India and one guy from Hong Kong. So we spent a lot of time together exploring, learning about American culture and each other's cultures. Um, and this was a great support network to have. Being post-professional students, we're in a really, really beneficial position because we can study with the entry-level master's students, but we can also study with the OT doctoral students. Um, because we've already 
got our bachelors, there are a limited, there's only three uh, compulsory classes. The other five classes, you can choose what you want to do, which means that it's very flexible and you can tailor it to your interests. There's also the opportunities to engage in independent studies. These are one-to-one -one studies with a lecturer based around objectives that you want to achieve in a given subject. So this enabled me to tailor this degree to my interests, which was very, very beneficial. So some of the differences in the studying was that we were graded all the way through. So from the second or third week, I was submitting work that was being marked and contributing towards my final mark for that module. So rather than doing one piece of work at the end, like one large essay, I was doing lots of smaller pieces of work that contributed to an overall bigger piece at the end. The structure of the course was very different. So the entry-level master's students complete nearly two years of academic work and then they do six months' worth of placement at the end of their degree. During the two years, they do complete some bits of field work. So the links between theory and practice were slightly diff seen in a slightly different way. And for me, one of the biggest things was that a mental health placement is, a mental health placement is not required in the US. So you do your placements, but whereas we have to have one in mental health, it's not a requirement there. So starting with the fall semester, I took five classes, I had to take eight in total, so I took five in the fall semester, uh, clinical reasoning, outcomes, an independent study and group work, OT and psychosocial dysfunction and health and community systems. The first three I'm going to go through in more detail, but the OT and psychosocial dysfunction is the mental health class that I took to help me better understand the mental health system in America. And the Health and Community Systems is a class that I took to help me try and understand the American healthcare system and the difficulties of having various different insurance plans and how this impacts on the work of OTs there. So clinical reasoning. Clinical reasoning is about using evidence-based practice and EBP to so underpin what we do, helping to integrate EBP into answering our clinical questions. So right at the beginning of this class, I was asked to identify a case that has, was significant in my career, something that I had questions about I wanted to learn from. So I had this case um, about a female with borderline personality disorder who was really outstanding for my career. I learned a lot from working with this lady, but I also had many, many unanswered questions still. So. I chose to focus my clinical reasoning class on this question. So throughout the class you're supported to develop clinical questions, develop your rationale for that um, and start searching the literature. So I spent a lot of time searching literature, writing structured abstracts, critiquing lit literature and being able to synthesise the information, evaluate it, and then bring it all together to have a plan of action that would be um, achievable in my career. So, answering my question of what factors affect participation in activities of daily living for a physically healthy female with borderline personality disorder exhibiting physical difficulties. The things that inform my practice are that I found that there are a number of influencing factors. There are life events, social interactions, emotions and self-perceptions which have a significant impact on this client group's engagement in their occupations. And that as OTs, we need to be doing more background work in finding out about these influencing factors and how they are impacting on the individual's abilities and um, engagement in ADLs. So it's potential that some of these issues here, the influencing factors, were exhibiting themselves in a physical difficulty in my client. So in my future practice I will be concentrating more on these areas during my assessment phase to make sure that I've gathered this information and gathered the client's perception of how these factors influence them. And I'll also share these findings and support my colleagues to do the same 
and this is something that I have been able to do since returning to the UK. And finally, I identified a need for further research. So in order to get this answer, I had to search through lots and lots of articles. There is a limited amount of research with OTs and working with pe females with borderline personality disorder. And I was struggling extremely to find any research linking in any physical difficulties. So this is an area for further development. So the second class I'm going to talk to you about is outcomes. So outcomes is about um, measuring the effectiveness of a programme. So again, I can relate this into my practice and use something from my practice to measure. And I chose an inpatient mental health meal preparation. So this is a weekly cooking group programme that we run within the unit that I work. So the outcomes is all about being able to identify a programme, being able to identify your stakeholders, what outcomes you're going to measure and how you're going to measure them, what indicators you're going to use, what tools you're going to use to gather the information. And then it's also about analysing the data and then reporting the findings. So as I mentioned, I've done this on a live programme, but unfortunately I didn't have any live data to work with, um, so I had to use mock data within the classroom. Um, with the in intention that this would then be implemented in practice when I return to the UK. So to give you a bit of an idea about the study, the purpose of it is to examine the effectiveness of meal preparation programme on the knowledge, skills, routine, social skills and confidence of participants. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the MoHost. This is an assessment that I use routinely in practice within the setting that I work. So we chose this as an outcome measure to use in the meal preparation programme. We looked at the psychometrics of it to make sure that it fitted the population that we were using and then proceeded to use this. The confidence was measured by a self-report scale of the service users. So one example of an outcome that I had was that service users would have increased knowledge and skills in meal preparation by attending the programme. And the way that I would know whether this had been achieved was that 80% of service users would have improved by one point or more on the process skills subsection of the mail post, and 80% would have improved by one point more in pattern of occupation. So here I'm able to directly link my outcome measure into my, um, the outcome that I want to measure. So I'm di directly linking mail host to my outcomes. I also have to think about the influencing factors and there are a lot of them in mental health. So I have to think about things like the diagnosis, the symptoms, their motivation, whether they can attend the group or not. And these are all things to think about when you're planning um, a project like this. Oh, this slide is gone slightly wrong, but basically this is what outcomes can look like. Um, the green area indicates the, name, uh, the number of people that have improved and this actually shows 80 and 85% across <coughs> personal occupation and process skills. The blue section is an area of no change and the yellow is an area of decline. So based on my mock data, so this is data that I have inputted um, based on my experience in mental health, on this occasion I've identified that the outcome has been met because we have identified a minimum of 80% increase in both areas. So this is just an indicator of what you can do with an outcomes measurement to evidence how effective your programmes are being. So as I mentioned, I completed this with the intention of implementing it in practice. And we started to do so. We've reintroduced OTs into our cooking groups. We started using the single assessment mo host. However, we've not yet got to a point of collecting live data. And this is just an indication of how things can pan out slightly differently in practice with resourcing issues and other things that you come up against along the way. So finally, for the fall semester, I did group work in mental health and this was an independent study. So I'd identified my area of interest in mental health, um, but having looked at the timetable, 
there were limited opportunities for me to um, explore that further through the classes. However, there was a class on the timetable that was called group work. So that's an area that I'm interested in. So I met with the lecturer, um, Dr. Sharon Schwartzberg, who is um, a well, uh, well-known author of group work and has created a functional model. So she, I went to talk to her about the group work class, and she's, we quickly identified it wasn't the right class for me. Um, it was something very similar to what I completed in my undergraduate. But what we did was Sharon very kindly agreed to do an independent study with me. So we did a one-to-one -one study where we focused the learning objectives around what I wanted to learn. So I wanted to learn about group work models, and I was interested in outcome measures as uh, linked to the previous class. So we spent some time devising some objectives and how I would achieve these over the semester. So there were two aspects of this class. One of them was that I was going out into practice and I was going to meet OTs and find out about group work within some of the hospitals in the Boston area. And the other was that I was going to be writing some papers to answer and demonstrate my um, development of knowledge in this area. So I started off by going to Tufts Medical Centre and meeting with the OT there. And although I wasn't able to observe any of her groups, I was able to get information about her group timetable, about what groups she was facilitating. And this was my first big indication about the differences between inpatient mental health, OT practice in the USA and the UK. So the OT there primarily ran groups. Most days uh, she ran several groups a day, whereas in my practice, I primarily do assessments and discharge planning and I run around two groups a week. So there's already a vast difference in what we do. And I found this from other OTs and other mental health settings in the Boston area as well. So within my papers I was looking at group work models to start with and I wrote a paper comparing different ones that were out there. And in my second paper I looked at how people are measuring the evidence at the effectiveness of their groups. Um, what are they using? So when I was doing these papers, this raised a lot of questions for me. The biggest one being, where is the evidence? I found some evidence, but most of it was slightly dated or low level evidence. And some of it was written by other professionals. This raised lots of questions for me, even more questions. Um, Additionally, during this time, I also identified that only 2.9% of OTs in the US work in mental health. Um, this shocked me, so I contacted COT to find out what, what the numbers are in the UK. They didn't have any exact numbers, but they estimated it was just under 30% in the UK. So that is a huge difference and raised even more questions for me. So based on all this information that I had gathered and all these questions that I had asked, um, Sharon and I adjusted the end of my, uh, my class and changed it to a focus on the impact of this on education and professional standards in the workforce. Because if OTs aren't generating evidence, how can we teach EBP in group work and how can we keep that going in practice? Um, and this then led on to myself and Sharon co-authoring an article called Group Work in, Men in Patient Mental Health, Can We Hold On To It? This hasn't been published yet, but it, it raises lots of questions about this area and about the impact on education, about the impact on retaining OTs in mental health, especially with the ongoing changes in the NHS. With a privatised healthcare system, OTs need to be very good at evidencing what they're doing um, and bring an EBP into practice. So we need it there behind us in order to keep our posts there. So it's a potential longer term question for the profession. So moving on to the spring semester, I only had three classes to take now because I've taken five <coughs> in the fall semester. So I had clinical research, another independent study, this time in sensory integration in mental health, and finally my practicum. So, I don't expect you to be able to read that, don't worry. Um, but this is my clinical research module. So, this is one of the mandatory modules. And during this time, you are 
put into small groups where you work on a live research project. You're linked up with a mentor who is the primary researcher. And then during the class, you learn about research and conducting research. So it's about writing literature reviews, about methodology, writing hypotheses, um, gathering data, analysing data, and then sharing that information. So the project that I was involved in was selective attention in older adults, the right ear bias. This is not part of my clinical area. It's not something that I'm familiar with but it gave me so much transferable information and I was participating in research and it was such a great experience. So we started off the semester by working out what was selective attention and what is the right ear bias. So we did our literature searches and as a result of that came up with our hypotheses. We also visited the lab where the data was being collected so that we could have a better understanding of the process. We weren't actually gathering the data in our project. We were provided with live data to analyse. So there, there was a, an ongoing project and we were looking at the use um, of a behavioural measure and a hearing test to look at whether older adults are able to ignore information presented to the right ear. So after spending many hours with SPSS, we worked out um, how to use it and how to, and we came up with um, the data and analysed it. So we found that there is a right ear bias, which means that older adults have difficulty in ignoring information from the right ear. And that this isn't just a hearing acuity, this is a cognitive performance issue. So as OTs, this has an impact on what we do, on our environmental adaptation reducing background noise, where we position the person in the environment so that they can um, get the most out of it. And also thinking about things like memory strategies to help cognitive performance. So, at the end of your clinical research, you produce a poster, the research poster. I've got a copy there if anybody wants to have a look afterwards. And this is submitted to the Massachusetts Association um, State Conference. So ours was accepted to conference and it was presented in October last year. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go back to the States for it, but I did present it at the Trust OT conference that I attended in October here. So moving on to sensory integration, this was my second independent study. So this time I was working with Theresa May Benson, who is a well-documented author in sensory integration. So Teresa, I've worked with on other classes in the fall semester and she agreed to do this study with me to help me develop my knowledge and skills in sensory integration. This is an area that is very useful in mental health but I feel it's very underused in this country. So I wanted to increase that but in order to do that I need to be more confident with it and know how to do that successfully. So we started off, again, setting my learning objectives and started off with the basics of getting to grips with the theoretical frameworks and the different ones that are out there and understanding the differences between them. We then moved on to looking at the research that is currently out there in sensory integration and mental health, what's currently known, what's being done, what works well. And then we moved this on to relating it directly into my clinical practice. So this was about using a case study based on uh, the environment that I work in and the people that I work with, looking at the environment, assessment methods, goals and interventions. And I've been able to bring elements of this back into my practice already. So I have been able to use some sensory integration interventions. I've been able to support my colleagues to use sensory integration and then we also have a longer term plan for this, to introduce sensory boxes and develop a staff training programme. So the final class that I'm going to talk about is the practicum. So this is a bit like a placement, but there's no set objectives. Because I'm already qualified, I don't need to complete objectives of the placement. It's more about learning um, and sharing information and reflecting on the differences in 
in the in the settings. So, uh, as I've already mentioned, America has a private healthcare system. So I was my practicum was in a private hospital. So it was in Ar Arbor HRI. So the private healthcare system has a number of implications for OTs. It has an impact on the length of stay. So the average length of stay on the inpatient mental health unit in Arbor was around seven to eight days, whereas um, in the trust that I work, we're around 30 days of, as an average length of stay. So that impacts on what the OT can do with the patient in that time. So, as I've already mentioned, there are fewer OTs in mental health. So in this hospital, there was one OT for four wards, and each ward had around 20 beds. The OT was managed by a social worker, and the OT in turn managed art therapists and music therapists. So it was a very different setup from where I work. I am managed by an OT. I work in a team of OTs, and then I work with the nursing staff on the ward. Additionally, having the private healthcare system has an implication for what interventions the OT does. So, she does a lot of group work. She does limited one-to-one -one work because in order for the hospital to get reimbursed for any OT assessments or interventions, a referral needs to have been completed to the OT from the consultant, otherwise the insurance company don't reimburse. So this has lots of implications for what the day of an OT looks like in a private hospital in America compared to how it looks like for me here in the NHS. So this was a great opportunity for me to look at the differences between the USA and UK and realise just how vastly different they are. And there are a lot of benefits to both. In America they have great group work programmes and they're using sensory integration much more than we are. Here we are much more involved in assessments and discharge planning and have more of a say in that, that area of practice. But again, this raised lots of questions for me. What happens if the NHS is privatised? How do we hold on to OT in mental health? What do we need to do? So I think what came to me to start with is that in the short term, we need to be making sure that our patients, carers, colleagues and managers and commissioners know what OT is and understand the benefits that OT can bring to a team to make sure that they keep OT posts within those areas. And that's, that actually goes a long way in terms of retaining OTs within mental health. And the other is linking in to my other classes, using EBP, making sure we're using the research that's out there, measuring the effectiveness of our interventions and using the outcome measures that we all have access to. And the biggest thing for me in this is that I've already mentioned there's only 2.9% of OTs that work in mental health, and some states don't employ um, OTs in mental health at all, because OT is not a recognised mental health profession, which is quite shocking because that's kind of where we started. So it's certainly food for thought for the future. So aside from studying, I also worked as a graduate assistant whilst I was there. So I worked on the OT in psychosocial dysfunction module um, during the spring semester. I had previously sat this class in the fall. So I only worked five hours a week, but I was able to, my main responsibility was to plan and facilitate workshops. So this is an opportunity for me to be really creative and to mentor students and help them make those links between theory and practice. On occasions, I was asked to lecture as well, so for me that was a great opportunity because it's the area of interest of mine is in teaching and education. And there was the additional part of grading papers, tests and exams, which comes with any teaching assistant or graduate assistant job. And the added benefit of a small income. So this is something that I could then use to fund my travelling at the end of my time in America. There were also many additional opportunities. So I was fortunate enough to be invited along to the MAOT Mental Health Special Interest Group meetings. So I was able to network with OTs from across the greater Boston area and engage in some CPD activities. I attended the MAOT conference, which is the state conference. 
And then I attended the AOTA conference, which is a national conference. And this is where there are thousands of OTs in one place. Um, it's very overwhelming. There's a lot of information and a lot of opportunities for networking and learning there. And an incredible experience. One, if you get opportunity to do, I'd highly recommend it. And then outside of OT, I attended a VINFEN conference, which is a mental health conference. I also had some wheelchair skills training. Um, I completed lots of professional visits. I volunteered as the faculty representative for the post-professional students and the doctoral students. So this meant that once a month I would go to the faculty meeting and be the advocate and liaison between the, professional, the student body and the lecturers. So this was a great opportunity to get some insight into, um, into the faculty. So moving on to my new experiences. The most memorable for me, and the one that will stick with me forever, is the snow. I was in Boston for the most snowfall on record. Um, so from the middle of January through to the middle of April, all I saw was white, just constant covering of snow. Um, I think we had somewhere in excess of 110 inches over the three months. And this is just one morning when I had to dig my way out of the house in order to get safely down the steps. And although it was extremely cold and hard work, it was also quite fun to be in that environment, um, although I was ready for summer when it did arrive. And what amazed me about this was how life carried on as normal. So over the, over the three months, there was a couple of days when everything stopped, but generally life carried on. So still went to lectures, still went to work, everything was normal. I had opportunities to go to my first baseball game. So I went to a Red Sox game. Um, I went to basketball, so that was uh, the Boston Celtics. So I got a chance to start immersing myself in that American culture that I was talking about before. And I've mentioned that I attended AOTA's conference, but in addition to the learning aspect of the conference, it was in Nashville. So there was the amazing experience of the food, the music, and the culture. So spending three or four days in Nashville was a great experience. There were also many opportunities to be social, with housemates, classmates, and other people that I met along the way. So we went apple picking, uh, the bottom is our Thanksgiving dinner at our house, um, we went to the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and many, many other things along the way. There's always something going on, whether it be within your group of friends, or the Graduate Student Council, or the OT school, there was always some social aspect to it. I also had opportunities to do other things like whale watching, I went to the Boston Marathon, and at one point I did go to a renaissance fair where everybody else was pretending to be English and that was just a very, very surreal experience. <laughs> and in addition to all this, there was also just exploring Boston, just wandering around, doing the day-to-day -day things, enjoying the food. Um, it was all a great experience. So my final objective was to travel. So while I was there, um, I was determined to get this in. So I visited New York a couple of times before Christmas, once to visit friends and once to see New York at Christmas. Over the winter break, I went to Chicago, which was very cold, and San Francisco, which was nice and warm. And then after all the studying, this is when friends and family started to visit. So friends came over, went out to Cape Cod, uh, my dad came over, we went down to Washington, and then I did some travelling on my own, back up through Philadelphia and up to Portland, Maine. And also, in between, I'd been to Nashville as well. And this was a great opportunity for me, because I'd done travelling before, but a lot of this was done on my own, so really developed my confidence in just getting out there and doing it, and making the most of what was there. So what's changed? Professionally, I've got my Masters. I've developed my knowledge and skills in mental health specifically, and research. 
I'm more confident professionally now. I've got projects to implement and I've always got ideas for new projects. I've changed my focus more into education, both my own and others, because this is a real area of interest for me. It's enabled career progression. I've got professional networks now, across the world. I know OTs in India, in Hong Kong, in America. And now I'm much more confident and challenging and questioning old practice and new practice. What's best? What's, what's the right way to move forwards? So personally, I'm also more confident. Um, I've got lots and lots of new experiences, um, lots of things that I've learned from. I've got friends across the world who I'm still in contact with and I plan to visit. I've achieved many personal goals in the past 18 months and I've got changed perspectives. Having spent time living, studying and exploring with students from across the world, I've learned about new cultures um, and shared information about my culture. I've got lots and lots of wonderful memories um, which will stay with me forever and I've got lots and lots of future plans. So what's next? I've got new goals. Uh, I've got a change in career path. Next week I start my new job as an OT practice development lead where I will be supporting students in their practice placements, supporting their practice educators and supporting OTs in CPD activities. I am considering further study, so potentially a doctorate. I'm not quite sure yet. I plan to attend COT next year. Um, after attending AOTA, I feel I need to go back to conference. Um, so plan to attend COT. I would love to attend AOTA one day in the future. I will promote EBP and share my findings. So I've learned a lot from this Masters and I need to share that and make sure other people learn from it. I'm writing articles and I'll keep promoting OT and mental health. So, I've come a long way in my journey from applying for this first time back in 2011 to where I am now. And so the message is, never give up. This is something that I couldn't have achieved without this scholarship. Thank you very much.